É um enorme prazer uh, ter no Brasil uh, o nosso ídolo, uh, o que, quem a gente considera sucessor da linha missesiana, uh, o, o professor Hans Hoppe. O professor Hans Hoppe, uh, para quem não conhece, eu duvido que tenha alguém aqui que não o conheça, uh, mas ele avançou, entre outras contribuições, ele avançou muito a teoria do direito natural, Uh, através da teoria da ética argumentativa que ele desenvolveu, baseada em Habermas, que foi professor uh, dele. E, então, é uma enorme honra uh, apresentar o professor Hans, Hans Hermann Hoppe, que é membro sênior do Ludwig von Mises Institute, fundador e presidente da Property and Freedom Society, editor do Journal of Libertarian Studies e coeditor do periódico Review, of Austrian Economics. Recebeu o PhD e fez seu pós-doutorado na Goethe University em Frankfurt, Alemanha. E é o autor, entre, outro entre outros trabalhos, de uma teoria sobre socialismo e capitalismo, Democracy, the God that Failed, and the Economics and Ethics of Private Property. Professor Hoppe. First, I want to thank uh, Helio for this invitation, and uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for attending this conference and bearing with me for a little bit to hear hopefully something exciting and at least for some of you rather new. Um, let me begin by briefly talking about what I refer to as the problem of social order. Uh, imagine Robinson Crusoe alone on his island. Um, Robinson Crusoe can do on his island whatever he wants. The problem of social cooperation, um, the problem of orderly human conduct simply does not arise, arise, uh, arise for him. Um, in order for this problem to arise, there needs to be a second person appearing on the scene. Uh, so Friday appears on the scene. Um, now imagine that this island is like the Garden of Eden. There exists a superabundance of goods. Um, everything is available for free, just as the air that we breathe is typically available for free. Um, as long as this is the case, Obviously, no conflicts can arise between Robinson Crusoe and Friday, because whatever one person does, he never takes anything away from anyone else. Uh, the current supply of goods for him uh, is as high as it was initially, and there are as many goods left over for Friday uh, as they were before. Um, a conflict between Robinson Crusoe and Friday can only arise insofar as goods are scarce, um, insofar as goods do not exist in superabundance. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, there exist only two things that are scarce and only two types of conflicts can arise. Um, What is scarce, even in the Garden of Eden, where there is a superabundance of everything else, what is scarce in the Garden of Eden is, on the one hand, my own physical body, I have only one of it, uh, and the standing room where my body rests. Uh, if Robinson Crusoe wants to do something with Friday's body, or Friday wants to do something with Robinson Crusoe's body, If Robinson Crusoe wants to stand exactly at the place where Friday stands, then a conflict arises because there is a scarcity of, uh, of goods. And we would need in the Garden of Eden then also rules of peaceful human cooperation, of orderly human cooperation in order to avoid these types of conflicts that I just characterized. And in the real world, which is characterized, of course, 
while all around scarcity, where everything is scarce, we would need rules that make it possible that conflicts can be avoided with respect to all sorts of scarce goods. Now, in the history of social and political thought, all sorts of, and, and this problem, how we arrange peaceful relations vis-a-vis -vis scarce goods is what I call the problem of social order. In the history of social thought, all sorts of proposals have been made how we solve this problem of social order. And because a multitude of uh, proposals has been made, many people have thought there is no unique, no one correct solution to the problem of social order. But I want to argue that, yes, there exists one correct problem to the, social, to the problem of social order. There exists one exact correct answer to, to the question, how can we avoid interpersonal conflicts given that there are scarcity of goods? Let me just outline briefly what the correct solution is. Uh, it is a solution that has been known for a long period of time. It has been somewhat refined in the course uh, of the centuries, but the solution is rather, rather simple, as you will recognize very quickly. Let me formulate first the solution for the Garden of, for the Garden of Eden, uh, for paradise. There we only need one rule, and that rule is um, everybody can do whatever he wants, can move around wherever he wants, occupy any place he wants, as long as no other body is standing at the same, at the same place. Um, that is, or to formulate differently, we may place or move our own bodies wherever we want, provided only that no one else is already occupying or standing at a certain place. And outside of the Garden of Eden, uh, that is in the real world of all around scarcity, um, there are four interrelated rules that people need to follow in order to avoid all sorts of conflicts. The first one is every person is the exclusive owner of its own physical body. I can do with my body whatever I want. Nobody is permitted to interfere with it. Uh, if I want to do something to somebody else, then I need this other person's permission to do this. Um, that's the first rule. Um, we can immediately see that there are intuitively no other alternatives. Who else should be the owner of my physical body except me? Who else should own Robinson Crusoe except Robinson Crusoe? Should Friday own him? Uh, or should Friday and Robinson Crusoe own each bazaars jointly? But then immediately you see that this does not avoid conflicts, that causes conflicts. It makes conflicts, so to speak, permanent. Um, the second rule is every person is the private or exclusive owner uh, of all nature-given resources or goods that he has perceived as scarce and appropriated for the very first time. You can also formulate this rule. He who uses something that was previously unowned for the very first time becomes the owner of this thing. Again, the alternatives would be, uh, who else should own it? Somebody who was not the first one who, do, who does something to something else? Uh, the second one? Or the second and the first one together? Um, and immediately we recognize again that this, the alternative rules would not avoid conflicts, but they would make permanent uh, a conflict, in fact, permanent. Um, and the third and fourth rule follow basically from the first and uh, from the first and second. That is, every person who, with the help of his body and those things that he appropriated for the first time, produces something new, becomes the owner of what he has produced. As long as he does not 
physically damage the property of others in the course of producing what he has produced. And the fourth rule is, uh, once a good has been first appropriated or has been produced, ownership in such a good can only be acquired by a voluntary transfer from a previous owner to a later owner. Those are all the rules. If we would follow these rules, then all conflicts could be avoided uh, and we would have eternal peace, so to speak. Uh, cooperation would always go on in a completely smooth way. Um, I can spare myself the task of giving some detailed justification of these rules. I have done that in, uh, in various writings of myself, but I trust that you intuitively sense that we in our daily lives by and large recognize these rules and act according to these rules anyhow. Um, now, let me emphasize, however, this. Contrary to the frequently heard claim uh, that the institution of private property, as I described it, private property in bodies, private property in previously unowned things, and so forth, uh, in contrast to the frequently heard claim that um, private property is just a convention, I want to emphasize that this is definitely not the case. A convention serves a purpose and a convention is characterized by the fact that there exists an alternative to it. For instance, the, the Latin alphabet, which we use, uh, serves the purpose of written communication. Um, and there exists an alternative to it. We have, for instance, a Cyrillic alphabet that we can use instead of using the Latin alphabet. Uh, what, however, is the purpose of norms? What is the purpose of rules? And the answer is, uh, if there were no interpersonal conflicts whatsoever, then we would not need any rules whatsoever. Uh, we only need rules, we only need social norms because there are conflicts in this world. And the purpose of norms or rules is to avoid otherwise unavoidable conflict. Um, 